William Hurt would be great as Zarathustra. He even resembles the young Nietzsche in a vague kind of way. So, you know, especially if he dyed his hair and made him look shorter, which probably wouldn't be a problem. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the very fact that we live in an objective culture where one might make a mini-series Zarathustra and then have tons of Zarathustrians afterwards that dressed like Zarathustra and it adopted those values is already a sign that nihilism itself is in a certain way not a strong enough name for the threat faced by human subjectivity and lived experience, what remains of it in the terrain of our culture. And so I, I guess now I've moved sort of beyond trying to describe this beautiful poetic text which I would ask you to read and enjoy and in, on to another terrain, a terrain that is far different, far different. And uh, this is, won't come, to, come as a shock to, to, to younger people because uh, the search for meaning that I have been discussing is, is almost a joke of nostalgia among these people. I'll refer one more time to the movie Heathers. There's a sort of 1960s type teacher in that movie who says, oh, let's all hold hands and sing together. Well, all the young students just go, oh, God, Blech. See, for them, that's no good anymore. Love, friendship, understanding, common bonds have all been now deferred into encounter groups, you know? It's a long way from Wuthering Heights to Love Story by Eric Siegel. It's a tremendous historical distance. And yet it happens by degrees so we barely notice. It's the way, maybe this is the way people have always lost their own self-projects. It's by degrees. You wake up one morning and you notice that the journey you were on, you're not on it anymore, and somehow by degrees you've become something alien to yourself. I think this is a quite general experience in our culture, that by degrees and almost imperceptibly we become alien to ourselves. And that this is experienced by some of us older types, described by paleoconservatives as refuge of the 60s. It's described by us as a sort of loss of lived experience, but by some of the younger, giddier type theorists of the postmodern, it's described as a kind of liberation. In other words, uh, the, the, don't worry about alienation and ecstasy. Those things are over. Ecstasy is now the name of a designer drug for yuppies. And I don't want to hear about alienation because it's alienating to hear about it. We, we, we know that, that it's the case, but it's alienating for you to tell us about it. So it puts, it puts, you, it puts the critic in an unusual position in a society like that because uh, the critics of our society themselves are, of course, ordinarily commodified critics. Uh, I, I think that the, the best example of that uh, might be shows like the old Martin Downey show where you get a kind of populist redneck kind of criticism, which is every bit as elevated as the McLaughlin group, and certainly you listen just as much. Has anybody ever seen? I mean, the McLaughlin group won't sue me for describing their show because they just go, crucifixion of Jesus, right or wrong? Wrong, 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 maybe. You know? The right answer is right. And then you just go, that is, that's public discourse. Now notice about it this. While it is public, in the sense of publicity, it's unilateral, it's quick, it's fast, it's factoid, it is totalitarian, of course. It's duck speak. You can't think that quickly. You've got to duck speak. I mean, this is why the, the breakup of the Soviet bloc creates great confusion, because we've been taught that duck speak so long that now we don't know exactly what to talk anymore. It's hard to go. Those communists, Trojans, that, we never thought about that in the first place anyway. It was just duck speak. Now that it's all breaking up, we, it, it, new topics for duck speak are hard to find. And, and I guess one of them would be, you know, the Middle East. So, you know, those people are different than we are. Yeah. By the way, that, that, that is a moment of the communitarian in a postmodern landscape, is when you create a pseudo-community, a pseudo-community by opposing it to another pseudo-community. I'll give you an example. Uh, Saddam Hussein, as many people in the uh, Arab world knew, wasn't exactly a good Muslim. 
But we had to construct a certain kind of sort of Muslimic threat that would be palpable to people in our own cities and stuff out of this person and to create a kind of pseudo-communitarian consensus on the other side. Well, you know, I don't like war in general, but we have to stop naked aggression as opposed, I guess, to closed aggression. I've always, you know, looked at it the other way. Naked aggression seemed preferable to me than well-dressed, three-piece suited aggression. But, you know, I'm a bit primitive about that, I suppose. In any case, uh, uh, what the postmodern condition is about is the drying up of lived experience. And I'll give you an argument I'm, I don't think I agree with, but it will set the stage. And, and, and it's, I want it to, this argument to be kind of fun in the sense in which Zarathustra's fun. Don't take it that seriously, in other words. It's just one of these uh, postmodern French theorists, Baudrillard, and, it's, uh, and it was his account of the war in Iraq. And, and I want it, I'm not giving it to you as mine, but as a gift. Come to think of it, maybe I shouldn't give you this gift because I might take something from you. No, that's a joke. I'm just joking. No. Baudrillard was, was giving the following account of the war in Iraq. He said, uh, the name of the, it was in an interview in a German magazine, and, and this, remember, this is a, one of the postmodern theorists I'm talking about, not agreeing with. I'm saying that, in my view, there's a trajectory towards this condition. In the view of many of these people, we've already reached this condition of postmodern society, which I will specify in greater detail later, and connect to Nietzsche, because Nietzsche was one person who forecast the advent of a human-less subject less condition. Well, anyway, Baudrillard's account of the war was, uh, uh, it, the interview was called The Enemy Has Disappeared. And Baudrillard said that, that wh the reason that the war had been constructed in Iraq as a constructed televisual event was that if anything was left in the world that was real, lived experience, it would be war. So that if this virtual society of a consensual hallucination could stage a phony war with phony experiences and have people respond to it phonily, the real war wouldn't be against the Iraqis but against reality in order to kill the last remaining remnants of the real. That this society had already commodified reality to such an extent that they were down to the last few little niches of reality. And on the global stage, war looked like one, so it would be important to kill reality itself. Now, this is not to deny that Iraqis got killed and some of our citizens. But it's about the larger aims of the war was to kill reality itself, to make reality virtual reality and not real reality, a term that I now nostalgically use to refer to things like my own experiences and the experiences of other human beings. When I even talk that way, I feel kind of nostalgic about it. <laughs> but, but Baudrillard's argument went, well, look, you know, where did we see the event? We saw it on television. And, you know, uh, who is this Hussein? I mean, didn't hear about him before, haven't heard much about him since. Who is it? Well, now they're picking it back up a little, sorry. Uh, who is this fellow? And, wh and what is this? I mean, is this a real... You know, his point was deep and important, that from the moment it started, it was a CNN event that had its own, as it were, support built into it, of which the opposition was itself a part. And, and the opposition to the war itself became a part of the support of the war in the very necessity to pick up.